We are live. Good morning and welcome to this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. This morning, CPSC staff will brief the commission on its work to make off-highway vehicles safer. Today's briefing is timely, as this morning, CPSC amplified our public safety education efforts for ATVs and other off-highway vehicles ahead of the summer riding season. The dangers of riding off-highway vehicles are real and include not only debris penetration, but also overturning, collisions, and occupant ejection. CPSC's latest data show an annual average of more than 700 deaths and an estimated 100,000 emergency room uh, injuries involving these vehicles. What these data show is how vital it is for all riders to take off-highway vehicle safety seriously, but particularly young riders. CPSC's most recent report shows nearly 300 deaths among children under the age of 16 over the covered three-year period. It's critical that young riders um, always drive safely, wear protective equipment. Um, they should only uh, drive youth model vehicles and never adult vehicles. I urge parents and caregivers to provide good examples for younger riders. And urge younger riders to call out your parents when they're not acting safe. Now, today's hearing is, uh, is to allow the commission to hear from CPSC staff on recommendations for proposed rulemaking regarding one specific aspect of OHV safety, debris penetration. Reports of ROV slash UTV related fatalities and injuries involving debris penetration penetrating the vehicles prompted CPSC to publish an advanced notice proposed rulemaking in May of 2021 to consider whether there, there may be unreasonable risk of injury and death associated with ROVs and UTVs. Staff found a total of 107 incidents in CPSC databases between 2009 and 2021 involving debris penetration hazards. In addition, from 2014 to 2016, there were three de debris penetration recalls associated with the ROVs consisting of approximately 55,000 recalled vehicles, um, 630 incidents of debris cracking and breaking through the floorboards, and 10 injuries. Sp specifically, this package summarizes the analysis performed by CPSC staff in the following areas. The review of outside contractor SEA's test data and engineering analysis, examination of proposed performance requirements and test protocol, assessment of current voluntary standards for ROVs and UTVs, and summary of ROV UTV debris penetration related comments that were received in response to the 2021 AMPR and staff's response to those comments. I greatly appreciate the hard work the staff has put into preparing this package and I look forward to hearing about CPSC's work in this space and to explore the next steps we can take to prevent unreasonable risk of injury and death associated with debris penetration in OHVs. Today we have two briefers. One is Han Lim, project manager, director, uh, director of engineering sciences, and Barbara Little, attorney from regulatory affairs division. Also in attendance are Mary Boyle, CPSC's Executive Director, Austin Schlick, General Counsel, and Alberta Mills, CPSC Secretary. Once Mr. Lim and Ms. Little have completed the briefing, each commissioner will have up to 10 minutes to ask questions with multiple rounds if necessary. And I will now turn over the gavel to Mr. Lim and Ms. Little. Welcome and thank you. Good morning, Chair. Colin Sark, Commissioners Biaco. Feldman and Trumka. Barbara Little, attorney with the Office of General Counsel, and I, Han Lim, mechanical engineer and project manager, will be giving you a presentation on the re recreational off highway vehicle ROV and utility task terrain vehicle UTV debris penetration notice of proposed rule. Next slide, please. The agenda for our presentation is first, we'll explain. Sections 7 and 9 of the Consumer Product Safety Act. Then we'll proceed with the product description, hazard description, the advance notice of proposed rulemaking summary. Then we'll discuss incident data review, recalls, 
contract work done by SCA Limited. And we'll talk about the NPR public comments and our staff responses. Then we'll comment on the adequacy of the voluntary standards. Then proceed with preliminary regulatory analysis, initial regulatory flexibility analysis, and we'll conclude with staff recommendations. Staff recommends a proposed performance requirement of no debris penetration when a test ROV UTV or simulated ROV UTV test sled fitted with a test floorboard traveling at a minimum of 10 miles per hour collides with a stationary two inch diameter oak dowel. Staff believes the current aftermarket solutions that exist in the marketplace demonstrated feasibility. The proposed performance requirement will reduce the risk, will reduce the uh, debris penetration hazard from ROVs and UTVs. And now I will turn it over to Barbara Little who will explain section seven and nine of the CPSA. Good morning. As Chair Hans Zarek mentioned, I'm Barbara Little and I'm an attorney with the Office of the General Counsel in the Regulatory Affairs Division. I'll be giving a brief overview of the statutory framework for issuing a standard under the Consumer Product Safety Act. This rulemaking falls under Section 7 and 9 of the CPSA. Section 7 of the CPSA authorizes the Commission to issue consumer product safety standards that consist of performance requirements and or requirements for warnings or instructions. The requirements must be reasonably necessary to prevent or reduce an unreasonable risk of injury associated with the product. Next slide, please. Section 7 of the CPSA also states that consumer product safety standards must be issued in accordance with the procedures in Section 9 of the CPSA. Section 9 of the CPSA provides procedural and substantive requirements for issuance of a consumer product safety standard. Section 9 provides that the Commission may initiate rulemaking through publication of an advance notice of proposed rulemaking or ANPR in the Federal Register. And as the chair mentioned, the commission published an ANPR in the Federal Register in May of 2021. Next slide, please. Section nine specifies that a notice of proposed rulemaking or NPR must include the text of the proposed rule, alternatives to the proposed rule considered by the commission and a preliminary regulatory analysis. Pursuant to section nine, the commission must make certain findings before issuing a final rule. The commission makes these findings on a preliminary basis at the proposed rule stage. Section nine also requires that the commission provide opportunity for both written and oral comments on the proposed rule. Next slide. As I mentioned, one component of an NPR is a preliminary regulatory analysis. Section 9 of the CPSA provides certain elements that must be included in the preliminary regulatory analysis. The analysis must address the potential benefits and costs of the rule and who is likely to receive these benefits and bear the costs. Reasons a standard submitted to the commission was not published as part of the proposed rule and alternative to the alternatives to the proposed rule and reasons why the alternatives were not chosen. In addition to supporting the preliminary regulatory analysis, information about costs and benefits associated with the rule also help form the basis for several findings required for the final rule. So, as I mentioned, to issue a final rule, the commission must consider and make specific findings and those findings must be included in the rule. Although the commission does not have to make these findings at the NPR stage, preliminary findings are included in the NPR because section nine requires that the findings must be included in the regulatory text as part of the NPR. Including the preliminary findings in the NPR also provides an opportunity for interested parties to comment on the findings. This slide shows eight of the nine required findings. Next slide, please. The final finding deals with voluntary standards. If a voluntary standard that addresses the issue has been adopted and implemented, the commission must find that either the voluntary standard is not likely to eliminate or adequately reduce the risk of injury, 
where substantial compliance with the voluntary standard is unlikely. I'll now turn it back over to Han, who will provide further information about the briefing package and the draft proposed rule. Next slide, please. Thank you, Barbara. Now I will cover the products that are in scope. Pictured here, starting at the top, we have two types of ROVs, a utility type ROV and a recreational type ROV. On the bottom, we have an example of a typical UTV. The utility-oriented ROVs and UTVs are generally used for work-oriented tasks, as, as seen here with their uh, cargo beds that are larger in, compared to the, in comparison to the recreational type ROVs. And the recreational type ROVs are generally used for leisure, trail riding, or competitive racing type of purposes. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to show you some examples of products that are not in scope. Going clockwise, starting from the upper left, we have all-terrain vehicles, also known as ATVs, golf cars, personal transport vehicles, also known as PTVs, low-speed vehicles, and go-karts. Next slide, please. ROVs and UTVs share similar features. Both are motorized vehicles designed for off-highway use with four or more wheels with tires designed for off-highway use, steering wheels for steering control, non-straddle seating for one or more occupants, foot controls for throttle and braking. What separates ROVs and UTVs is maxim maximum speed. R ROVs have maximum speeds greater than 30 miles per hour, whereas UTV maximum speeds are typically between 25 and 30 miles per hour. Also, another distinguishing feature is UTVs are equipped with larger cargo beds with higher loading capacities than, than in comparison to ROVs. Next slide, please. So a little bit more than a year ago, the NPR was published on May 11, 2021. The scope of the NPR covered fire hazards for ATVs, ROVs, and UTVs, and debris penetration hazards for ROVs and UTVs. The NPR concluded the applicable voluntary standards did not have performance requirements to address fire and debris penetration hazards. Next slide, please. The current scope, the current NPR scope is only for ROV and UTV debris penetration hazards. At the ANPR stage, the Commission noted that because the rulemaking involved three vehicle types and two different hazard patterns, it was possible to divide the rulemaking into separate rulemakings at the notice of proposed rulemaking stage. Accordingly, this draft proposed rule will address the debris penetration hazard associated with ROVs and UTVs and staff intends to address fire hazards associated with ATVs, ROVs, and UTVs in a separate rulemaking. Next slide, please. There are two applicable voluntary standards. For ROVs, there's the American National Standard for Recreational Off-Highway Vehicles developed by Recreational Off-Highway Vehicle Vehicle Administration Association, also known as the ANSI Rova 1 2016. For UTVs, the American National Standard for Multipurpose Off-Highway Utility Vehicles developed by Outdoor Power Equipment Institute, also known as OPI. And the standard is anti-OPI B71.9-2016. Next slide, please. And now I will describe the debris penetration hazard. Debris, usually tree branches, can puncture the floorboard and pose impalement and laceration hazards. In this slide, the left photo shows a tree branch that penetrated through the floorboard from the view of the cabinet in the passenger seat. The right photo shows the branch from an exterior view, and in this particular incident, both the driver and passenger were injured. Next slide, please. With regard to debris penetration-related deaths and injuries, there were 107 incidents of which there were six deaths, 22 injuries, and 79 non-injuries. Tree branches and logs can puncture 
through floorboards and can pose impalement and laceration hazards at speeds as low as two miles per hour. The deaths involve impalements to the heart, chest, and thigh. The injuries we've looked at involve ankle abrasions, calf laceration, abdomen impalement resulting in stomach, liver, pancreas injuries, leg bruises, and scrapes. Next slide, please. In addition to the aforementioned incidents, staff is aware of three ROV debris penetration related recalls. Collectively, there are approximately 55,000 affected vehicles and approximately 630 incidents. The recalling firm describes the incidents as debris cracking or breaking through the floorboards of the vehicles. Next slide, please. And now I will shift gears and explain the contract work done by SEA Limited. The goals of the contract were to quantify the speeds and energies necessary for debris penetration of standard ROV floorboards and aftermarket floorboard guards. SEA developed two test methods. First, a full-scale ROV debris penetration uh, using an autonomous driverless robotic ROV. Second, a simulated vehicle sled, which is essentially a ROV test frame fitted with floorboards and aftermarket floorboard guards and weights to simulate a fully loaded ROV that can move linearly along the track. Both of these test methods involve the test vehicle or simulated sled colliding with a stationary test dial. The next set of slides will visually illustrate these test methods. This video will show two test sequences with the simulated vehicle sled and one test sequence with a driverless robotic ROV test. Please play the video. So this first test sequence shows a sled fitted with a standard floorboard moving at two and a half miles per hour. And in this instance, we see debris penetration have occurred here. In the second test sequence, we see an aftermarket guard installed with no penetration with the sled moving at 10 miles per hour. In the third test sequence, we see a driverless robotic ROV colliding with a stationary dial at 10 miles per hour. Thank you. Uh, please advance to the next slide. Perhaps the video may have been a bit fast, so here are some time-lapse photos. The first test showed a simulated vehicle sled with a standard floorboard installed and weights to simulate the weight of a fully loaded ROV. The sled was traveling at two and a half miles per hour when it struck the stationary dial. And as you can see on the far right photo, the dial penetrated the floorboard. Next slide, please. Now this next slide, now this next set of time-lapse photos show a simulated vehicle sled with a commercially available aftermarket aluminum floorboard guard installed. Unlike the previous slide, the test dial did not penetrate the floorboard. The aluminum floorboard guard had sufficient thickness, rigidity, and stick deflecting properties to allow the test dial to deflect and allow bending forces to break off the dial, accomplishing the goal of preventing debris penetration. As we go left to right, starting from the top row, we see the test dial lined up with the intended target. In the second photo, we see the test dial contacting the surface of the floorboard guard. The third photo shows the stick being deflected or pushed away due to the material strength properties of the aluminum floorboard guard and the curvature and contours to, facil to facilitate deflection. The last two photos show the dial breaking off, um, where the fourth photo shows actual shards of wood separating and then finally, in the last photo, we see the dial breaking off into many wood fragments. Next slide, please. In the final set of time-lapse photos, we see the driverless robotic ROV colliding with a stationary dial at 10 miles per hour. 
A stationary floorboard is installed and no floorboard guard was installed. As you can see on the right photo, the dial made full penetration into the passenger occupant cabin area. Next slide, please. Now I will summarize the contractor's uh, findings. SCA concluded that the 10 mile per hour test replicated real world scenarios. The standard plastic floorboards experienced debris penetrations at speeds as low as two and a half miles per hour. Tests with aftermarket floorboard guards show the risk of debris penetration is vastly reduced if the stick is deflected and bending forces break the stick instead of energy absorption. The likelihood of bending and breaking the stick is increased at 10 miles per hour and greater. Next slide, please. Now I'll shift gears again and speak about the ANPR comments and staff responses. There were 10 public comments of which four supported the NPR. Two comments stated that it's not clear whether the debris penetration hazard incidents were caused by a lack of clear sight, user error, or whether the driver and or passenger were injured, impaired. One of these comments also states it, was, it is unclear when the product is being dangerous due to improper installation, inspection, operation, and or maintenance. Next slide, please. Staff response was that the pre penetration incidents occurred during non severe conditions. 44% of the incidents we looked at that had information regarding speed involved speeds at 5 miles per hour or less, 66% at 10 miles per hour or less, and some at speeds as low as 2 miles per hour. The vehicles, these vehicles are marketed and intended to be driven in wooden trails. Next slide, please. Two comments assert the NPR should be withdrawn due to insufficient information to, de to determine that there is an unreasonable risk of injury and that debris penetration incidents are rare and involve highly dissimilar factors. Our response was that at least six deaths and 22 injuries have occurred and illustrate the potential risk for more injuries and more deaths. Staff's analysis indicates debris penetrations occur at low speeds in areas with branches that a user would expect to be able to drive the vehicle. Next slide, please. Four comments advocated voluntary standard activities in lieu of rulemaking to address the debris penetration hazard. The staff's response was that since 2018, staff met with OPEI and ROVA multiple times to discuss incident data, recalls, and possible performance requirements to address the brief penetration hazard. To date, there are no performance requirements in the voluntary standards to address the debris penetration hazard. And each and every time we met with ROVA and OPEI's staff strongly encouraged them to address the debris penetration hazard through the voluntary standards process. And staff conveyed the same message in written form with multiple voluntary standards letters. Next slide, please. As I stated previously, to date, there are no performance requirements to address the debris penetration hazard in the applicable standards ANSI ROVA 1 2016 and ANSI OPEI B71.9 2016. Next slide, please. Based on staff's research, analysis, evaluation, and the contractor's test program, staff recommends a performance requirement of no debris penetration when a test ROV, UTV, or simulated ROV, UTV test led fitted with a test floorboard traveling at a minimum of 10 miles per hour collides with a stationary 2-inch diameter oak dowel. The current aftermarket solutions that exist in the marketplace demonstrated feasibility. The proposed performance requirement will reduce the, the debris penetration hazard from ROVs and UTVs. Next slide, please. Now I'll speak on the preliminary regulatory analysis. Staff is estimated costs and benefits for two types of solutions. One, a fully redesigned floorboard that uses most of the material in the original floorboards, and two, floorboards with floorboard guards. The benefits are avoided deaths and injuries from
from floorboards to debris penetration. The associated costs involve industry costs, which include the labor and materials required to redesign and test existing ROV and UTV models, as well as the cost of manufacturing and installation. The price impacts to market estimated as changes to consumer and product and, and producer surplus. Next slide, please. This next chart summarizes the possible floorboard solutions, the associated estimated costs, the annualized and per vehicle costs, and the benefit to cost ratio. Staff considered two alternatives to comply with the draft regulation. One is the redesigned floorboards and the other floorboard guards. The redesigned floorboards had an ability had a net benefit as indicated by the benefit cost ratio of 1.67, and floorboard guards had a ratio of benefits to costs just about even at 1.0. Next slide, please. With regard to regulatory alternatives, staff considered four alternatives and rejected all four. First, staff considered conducting marketing campaigns and recalls found that the marketing campaigns are not likely to reduce incidents encountering debris. It's largely unavoidable. The recalls are specific and not universal, and they're specific to a subset of existing products, cannot pre prevent the introduction of unsafe products, and are only put in place only after the incidents have already happened. The second alternative was to rely on the voluntary standard development. As mentioned previously, despite active CPSC involvement, since 2018, the voluntary standards have not addressed the debris penetration hazard. The third alternative was to limit the ROV and UTV speed to a maximum of 10 miles per hour. I believe that would impose a high utility cost to consumers and not address a large number of incidents. And finally, staff uh, considered the alternative of implementing a small batch exemption. However, the, the ROV UTV still by small businesses are not different from others, and they will still pose the same risk of injury. Next slide, please. The, seven of, in the initial regulatory flexibility analysis showed seven of 35 identified ROV UTV manufacturers meet the Small Business Administration criteria for small businesses. Five of seven small ROV UTV manufacturers are likely to experience significant economic impact. 19 of 26 identified ROV UTV <coughs> importers may meet the SBA criteria for small businesses. Small importers of ROVs and UTVs are unlikely to experience significant economic impact because foreign manufacturers are likely to issue general certificates of conformity, also known as GCCs, and unlikely to exit the market if GCCs are not if GCCs are not issued, the 13 of 19 smaller importers could experience a significant economic impact. Next slide, please. So, in conclusion, staff recommends a proposed performance requirement of no debris penetration when a test ROV UTV or simulated ROV UTV test sled fitted with a test floorboard traveling at a minimum of 10 miles per hour collides with a stationary two-inch diameter oak dowel. The current aftermarket solutions that exist in the marketplace demonstrate a feasibility. The proposed performance requirement will reduce the debris penetration hazard from ROVs and UTVs. Next slide, please. This concludes our presentation. Thank you. Now we'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Lim. Thank you, Ms. Little. At this point in time, we're going to turn to questions from the commission. We'll do so in uh, 10 minutes per commissioner with multiple rounds if necessary. So, first, going to recognize, recognize myself for, for 10 minutes and again, uh, thank the staff for the presentation and the work they've done in putting together the proposal. Um, I note in the, the proposal doesn't cover youth ROVs, in part because of the low ground clearance and smaller wheel area in the, the one youth ROV the staff focused on. This particular youth ROV configuration appears to allow for a lower space for debris penetration and a lower likelihood of debris penetration than 
the, uh, the larger adult size ROVs that are being tested. However, is there anything that would prohibit, I guess this is a question from Mr. Lim, anything that would prohibit a uh, youth ROV from being manufactured with a higher ground clearance and a larger wheel uh, well area? Well, at this, at this stage, we're not aware of any prohibitions. However, there are anthropometric limits to what a youth could safely use and thereby limits how a large manufacturer could safely make a youth ROV. So, there's, what I heard is there's nothing that prohibits them from manufacturing it. You think that those might be unsafe, but we don't have any standards for that at this point in time, do we? Correct. We don't have any standards for that. Um, if the main, if the youth ROV was manufactured with a higher clearance and larger well area, would the youth ROV have a similar risk profile as the adult ROV? And put it differently, is there anything that would in the proposed rule that would prohibit a manufacturer from producing a youth ROV with a similar risk profile that we're seeing in the adult size ones? Let's check this, Mr. Lim, as well. All right, so there's nothing in the uh, in the proposed rule that would prohibit a uh, youth, a large youth uh, ROV, but again, there are limits to what size uh, ROV a youth could safely handle, and staff is certainly interested in comments about defining uh, youth ROVs for this rule. Um, thank you. I'm going to pause my questions at this point in time and turn over to um, Commissioner Biacco. Recognize you for 10 minutes. You're muted, uh, Commissioner Bialko. Thank you, and, and thanks again, uh, Chair Hon Uh Thank you both for the presentation. Mr. Lynn, are the floorboard guards removable? If we add a floor floorboard guard, can a consumer then, after after they purchase it, take them off? I mean, are you referring to the aftermarket products? Well, if, yes, I mean, if what, go ahead. If you're referring to the aftermarket products, I mean, that's something that it's, it's a product that a consumer can install themselves. So, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm mean, asking it, about, okay, I'm sorry. I, 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 it was my understanding that it was the, um, the floorboard guard was one of the proposed solutions here, correct? Yes. Okay, and, and that wouldn't be an aftermarket floorboard guard. It would be installed um, on the original um, equipment, correct? It's installed on the original equipment um, that will depend on the manufacturer if they make it removable. I mean, if, if it's the, the manner in which it's fastened, if, if it's riveted, it's probably going to be more difficult. But if it's nut and bolted, then perhaps it can be removed by it. That, that, that to me is significant. Is there anything in the proposed rule that addresses that? I. Yeah, we, we do, and the staff briefing package, it does not specify the attachments. It's, it's just a performance standard that the vehicle has to be able to withstand this uh, impact loading. How they do that uh, was, uh, was left uh, uh, for them to decide. Uh, and certainly we could take questions or comments on, uh, on that concept. Nobody thinks that's significant? If this is our, if this is a proposed solution to this uh, debris penetration, yet somebody buys it and then removes the guard, and we see this with tons of other products, why would that be a viable solution? What am I missing here? Yeah, so I, I think again, it, it comes down to the uh, uh, mechanism of how the how the manufacturers do that and uh, it, when staff created a performance standard we were looking at uh, uh, at just dealing with protecting against that impact loading uh, but certainly we uh, again I think we can add questions uh, to that effect so um, there was a slide mr. Lynn that you had that said one of the uh, comments uh, said that the um, and I don't remember the slide, uh, the word specifically, but somebody said there were highly dissimilar factors 
in some of the other um, injuries or, or deaths that occurred. Can you tell me what those highly dissimilar factors were? Well, I think we were addressing the comment as that most of these, or, or majority of the incidents were occurring at lower speeds. Um, there were about over 40% at five miles per hour, six, over 60% being at less than 10 miles per hour. And, the, and our response is more about just the scenarios that these, these uh, vehicles are, are uh, used in and trails and and similar. Well, I know that. I, well, I, I do understand. I uh, trust me. I do understand all of this, and I understand the points. What I'd like to know is, were there truly highly dissimilar factors? I'd like to hear if there were. If what you're saying is the factors that were proposed by the commenter or commentators were really the same type of thing, different speeds and such, that's one thing. But if they were highly, highly different, like somebody was running it up a tree, for example, I, I would be interested in hearing. I'll we'll jump in those. just um, momentarily, but I, I believe that um, this particular commenter had mentioned that in one instance, um, the, the driver was driving uh, through a stream or through some water. Um, the commenter was also um, characterizing that some of the drivers may have been impaired um, through alcohol use. Um, but right, it, you know, I think um, from what staff has said in the briefing packages and in staff's view, they, these weren't, these don't really constitute um, highly dissimilar factors such that the hazard or the risk can't be regulated. I mean, these are, these are intended to be driven off road where there will be branches, there may be streams, and you know, it's foreseeable that a consumer will encounter that when they're we're driving an off road vehicle. Okay, just out of sheer curiosity, if you don't mind, just to send me those highly dissimilar factors, I, I just would like to look at them. Um, otherwise, I don't have any more questions. And I, I appreciate your responses. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to thank uh, our presenters today for uh, the work that you put into this package. It's quite a lengthy package, as well as the presentation today, which was which was fairly comprehensive uh, and helpful. So. Uh, thank you. I, I don't have many questions, uh, but I, I did want to uh, ask, uh, and I apologize, the uh, the slides here are not numbered, uh, but I am looking at uh, the preliminary regulatory analysis summary uh, that, that appears towards, um, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, and there's a footnote here uh, where staff seems to have calculated uh, the, the, the the dollar benefits per vehicle uh, for the redesigned floorboard and for the full board guard. Uh, and the footnote uh, talks about the, the cost differential between those two benefits uh, differing slightly uh, because the two solutions uh, are, are, are different due to their slightly different impacts on the market demand, uh, which would affect the number of incidents in the long run. I, I'm not sure that I understand what that means. Could you explain your thinking and rationale? Uh, yeah, so I, I think what the um, uh, I, I think what that footnote refers to is the uh, uh, the the fact that the uh, uh, choice for redesigning the floorboard versus the floorboard guard uh, is dealing with the uh, uh, differing approaches um, for uh, uh, for dealing with the hazard. Uh, and uh, what what staff was trying to account for there is the uh, impact uh, after o over the full life cycle of the products. So, and staff in this case used looked at a uh, thirty year design cycle, so encompassing multiple generations of vehicles, uh, and then tried to account for uh, how those dip the redesigned floorboard versus floorboard guard impacted the demand over that time period. Well, how did it impact the demand? Yeah, so I, I think what we uh, what we see in, in what you have in the um, uh, in that table summarizing is that it shows a higher price uh, as a result. Okay, I'm not sure I fully understand the rationale and, and the explanation that you're given. Maybe this is something that we can follow up on. Okay. 
I, I do have other questions. Uh, they are legal in nature and, and relate to, uh, you know, the fish sufficiency of, uh, of, of the work that's gone in here. It's probably not appropriate to get into into open session. So this is something that I'll follow up with our legal staff uh, after the fact, uh, if that's all right. Uh, again, I thank you for the presentation and would yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, turning to Commissioner Trumka. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I thank you, staff. I, I appreciate the the NPR package that you put forward and the work that went into it, um, and the presentation that you've given here today. Uh, look, I, I've got a side by side, and and when I get into it, I close the door. I get into a very comfortable seat. I buckle my seat belt. I can turn on windshield wipers, roll down automatic windows, and I'm holding a steering wheel, and I've got a gas pedal. Everything about the vehicle feels like you're in a truck. My side by side actually costs more than my truck, so that tells you where my where my priorities are at, I guess. Um, but but the vehicle gives you a sense of security, and I think just like nobody worries about being impaled by a stick when they're in their truck, nobody would have expect, that expects that expects that risk uh, in their side by side either. But but it happens in side by sides because my feet are on a piece of plastic. And if a stick hits that, it, it can pierce it and stab in the leg or the stomach or the chest. And the data is showing that it happens to people that are inching along at a couple miles an hour uh, or to people at moderate cruising speeds of just 25 or 30 as well. And so, again, I want to thank our staff. You've been working on a solution. You proposed this NPR, and it's a great step. Um, I do have some questions on how we define scopes of products and things like that. So, so we define ROV and UTV in proposed sections 16 CFR 1421.2 A and B. And it looks like the main difference between those two, and, and Mr. Lim, you mentioned this before, the main difference is the top speed, correct? Yes, that's correct. So, you know, an ROV, as we looked at that definition, is a motorized vehicle designed or intended for off-highway use with the following features. Four or more wheels or tires designed for off-highway use, non-straddle seating for one or more occupants, steering wheel, foot controls for throttle and braking at a maximum vehicle speed over 30 miles an hour. And then the only difference with UTV is that instead of 30 miles an hour for ROVs uh, for top speed, UTVs have typically between 25 and 30 mile an hour top speed. So we're looking at measurables with these definitions. Something that calls itself an ROV doesn't avoid this proposed rule by having a top speed of 25, 29 miles an hour, right? I mean, that just makes it a UTV, correct? Correct. Yes, that, that's correct. Staff uh, sought to have as encompassing a, a scope as is supported by the incident data. So we're trying to capture uh, both sets of vehicles. Yeah, I know. I, I think that makes sense. Uh, but I think it does raise an issue that I see as one we might need to re resolve with the proposed rule, uh, because that, that's all crystal clear to me from the text of the rule itself that, that, that's being proposed. But I think we deviate that. Uh, deviate from that in response to one of the comments. And the proposed response is that, quote, at least one ROV manufacturer offers youth oriented ROVs that are smaller versions of the full sized ROVs. Uh, and then it says staff did not include these products in the scope of the proposed rule. So the first question there, that's a reference to Polaris Razor 200 and Polaris Ranger 150, correct? Okay. Yes. And so if you look at those, you know, you go on the Polaris website, they both have four wheels, they both have non straddle seating for one or more occupants, they both have a steering wheel, foot controls for throttle and braking, and they both have a maximum vehicle speed of 29 miles per hour. So they both fit the definition of UTV that's in the proposed rule. So I think, regardless, AI, hey, I don't see an exemption for youth ROVs in the text of the proposed rule itself, just in those comments in response to the comments. Um, I would say that. Sorry, staff didn't staff didn't intend to include youth ROVs. I'm not sure what's going on there. There's a lot of um, background noise. Um, staff didn't intend to include the youth ROVs in the scope of the proposed rule, but but you're correct that if you know if there's a vehicle that has a max speed of 29 miles per hour and has the other distinguishing features that are defined in the um, proposed regulatory text, that it would um, you know, it would, it would meet one of the definitions in, in the scope of the, of the proposed rule. And, um, I, I, I think that staff is, is, um, would, would welcome, uh, comments on the, 
the appropriateness of, of including uh, youth ROBs uh, in in the scope of the rule. Um, that said, I'll, I'll also reiterate um, from an engineering perspective, uh, the information in the briefing package does um, does state that because of the the configuration of both the um, the the wheel well and the ground clearance taken taken together, um, staff doesn't believe that the the youth models are as susceptible to debris penetration incidents, and and we have not in fact seen any incidents related to the um, youth models. You know, I, I appreciate that clarity. So I think it's it's something that I do hope that we iron out and, and just provide some clarity on as sure. we work through this. But Absolutely. I think we're, you know, it's on our radar. We can we can work that out. I think that one thing you mentioned there, um, I do think I, I encourage us to reevaluate a little bit on the clearance issue uh, because the youth Polaris uh, Razor 200 has 10 inches of ground clearance and that is identical to the adult Polaris Ranger 500. So it doesn't have lesser ground clearance than at least one of the, the adult models, actually several of the adult models there. And the Youth Ranger 150 is, is right in the same neighborhood at eight inches. So I think we ought to take a pretty close look at that. Um, and if they did have less ground clearance, it would help them pass the penetration test. So um, just something to think about there. I, I think that one other thing to think about on a slightly separate topic, we do this in the NPR, we, we do it elsewhere, and I think a lot of people do it. And we draw the distinction between UTVs and ROVs. I don't really think the public knows what we're talking about with those terms. Maybe they don't have to know rulemaking, but as we talk about these things, you know, those are functionally the same vehicles. I don't think people know the difference when they're buying them and everybody calls them side by sides. So, so I think that going forward, at least in communications with consumers and things like that, it'd be really useful to adopt the terminology that people understand rather than tracking acronyms that were created for other purposes. I, I take your point and, and I agree in terms of uh, messaging to consumers. I will say for the you know text of, of the proposed rule and the context of rulemaking, it, it's helpful to identify them um, in terms of how they have been used in the past and, and the sort of industry usage and and be able to define them um, with with um, yeah, that they're they're defining characteristics. So, in, in terms of rulemaking, I would say that the the distinction may make more of a difference than in terms of the consumer messaging. Yeah, and I think you know we do a good job describing what we're talking about here. So, in this rule, when yeah. we look at the characteristics that they have, we do a good job making sure we're we're, we're being clear there. Just something to think about as we talk about this going forward. And, and I want to address one other thing that came up. It came up in comments, and and one that you were asked to address. One of the comments. I think every time we mention regulating side-by-sides or ATVs, we hear unfounded and false attacks on the people that use them. And industry would like you to believe that we're all drunk daredevils trying to do stunts, but in reality, that, that I mean, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Like, we're driving our kids through the outdoors, teaching them about the woods or, or creeping up to the deer blind. So I do want to throw that out there, but I think in, in this instance, particularly any attacks like that, they, they certainly fall flat with this rule because we're seeing drivers impaled at two miles an hour. This is not something you could even come close to blaming on, on use of the product. So um, I'll leave that there. I did have one last question I wanted to address. It's uh, it's with the way we're analyzing the impact on American businesses. And it looks possible that we're still counting companies with uh, a US entity as US manufacturers if they've shipped manufacturing jobs overseas. And I hope my reads wrong on that, but I want to make sure we're accurately reflecting where manufacturing occurs with that tally. So uh, this isn't a question for now. It's just a, a question for a follow up. If you could give me a list of the manufacturers that we counted. I mean, we had, I think, 17 US and then we listed a few other countries just with the manufacturers, the country we uh, credit them with in our tally and then where the manufacturing actually occurs. Yeah, we, we certainly can and will provide that list. Uh, I would note that our discussions on the U.S. versus foreign uh, manufacturers is tied to the required regulatory uh, uh, flexibility analyses. And under the Small Business Administration guidelines for, uh, for those analyses, we're required to characterize the impact on small U.S. entities. And so even if a, so if a manufacturer has a U.S. facility, we are required to include it. And the fact that they also have foreign uh, facilities is irrelevant, although it does provide, it may provide some evidence that it 
uh, the entity does not have uh, does not meet the SBA requirements for quote unquote small. All right, uh, Dwayne, we can work that. Uh, you know, work to figure that out a little bit. If you could send me that, that that'd be fantastic. Uh, again, look, thanks for the briefing today. I, I learned a lot and I look forward to the public comments on, on the issues here. Um, and, you know, we're, we're keeping an open mind with this proposal. We want to make sure that um, we hear thoughts on any ways we can improve it. So, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I would look to my fellow commissioners to see if anybody wants a second round. I think I am okay at this point in time. Um, Hearing no requests, um, I would go back and thank the staff for this informative briefing and to the commissioners for their active participation. I look forward to continuing work on this issue and having uh, discussions with um, both staff and my colleagues to follow up on some of the questions that have been raised and um, about next steps going forward. With that, this uh, meeting is adjourned.